nice of you to join me today. So our topic today is uh, Chinese laundry. Actually, I'm going to start off with, uh, with a question. Uh, hands up if you've heard of the whole institution, the racial stereotype of the Chinese laundry. Hands up. Actually, maybe let's, let's switch this around. Who has not heard of the Chinese laundry? Who has not? We have one. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so many of you uh, have heard of the, um, the Chinese laundry. Um, so my purpose today is to, is to convince museums and curators why my ascription, the Chinese laundry, should be in museums. So my opening slide here is uh, Vancouver, 1884, uh, right in the waterfront here in Gastown. At the bottom it says, City Archives, J.S. Matthews. And this goes back to 1884. So 1884 would be uh, two years before the incorporation of Vancouver. So what I want to talk about today is the, the elephant in the room, not this room, but in the room of Canadian museums and Canadian archives uh, right across the country and also within uh, Chinese museums even. So I want to shine a light on uh, Chinese laundries, its significance in uh, Canadian history, uh, North America, what the Chinese referred to as uh, Gem San, Gold Mountain. So you may be interested uh, in knowing oh, why are you talking about this? Are you an authority on Chinese laundries? Are you an academic? Are you a historian? Uh, I'm none of that. In fact, I barely got past high school, actually. <laughs> so I have to tell you and confess that my only credential is that I was there. All right? When my parents purchased the laundry in 1948, shortly after... Uh, they, were, they got, to, got together again. So we, my family purchased the, the Union Laundry. Back then it was called Jinli Laundry. And uh, after my parents purchased it, it got renamed to uh, Union Laundry. Uh, not because of its uh, labor practices, but because of the street we were on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and in case you didn't know, Union past Vernon Drive becomes Adenac. It becomes Adenac until it hits boundary. Then it resumes being named uh, Union Street again. And that's because the people east of Vernon did not want to be associated with those people on the 200 block. Back then, uh, this is before my time now, it was, oh, there was bootleggers, there was things happening that, uh, for whatever reason, people wanted to, east of Vernon wanted to um, change this, the name. So here's an image here from uh, Life Magazine USA, February 17th, 1947. And this gentleman looks very tired. Long days, long hours, maybe his wife is in China, and uh, just wondering about his lot in life, how, if this is really indeed a gold mountain. There are, as far as I know, there are no laundry installations in museums in British Columbia, uh, not at the Museum of Vancouver, not at the Royal BC Museum, and not at the brand new Chinese Canadian Museum. So with my talk today. I'm hoping if there's any curators out there in Greater Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, I hope to uh, change your mind. So as, as John mentioned in the opening, uh, that, uh, that old phrase, uh, <laughs> cringeworthy phrase, no ticky laundry, and this is just straight off the internet, all right? What is the origin of the phrase no ticky, no laundry, or no ticky, no washi, or no ticky, no shirty? No Ticket, No Laundry comes from the ridiculing the speech of Chinese immigrants who stereotypically uh, ran laundries. It can be used to mean if you don't have something required, uh, you won't get what you want. In this spe specific case, uh, you must have the receipt uh, from dropping your laundry off to get your laundry back. I wouldn't think it would be in good taste nor politically correct to use this phrase now. You are correct. <laughs> Uh, Chinese laundry is a brand of women's and handbags. Uh, anybody in here wearing uh, shoes or handbags made by Chinese laundry? All right, you don't have to put your hand up. So, so this, is, this is to show you how even like a fashion company recognizes that the Chinese laundry is a brand. It's recognizable, and much to my chagrin, this company has used it as, well, it's cultural appropriation, what can I say? 
All right, here's an image here from uh, William Smith, better known as Amor de Cosmos, uh, British colonist, colonist uh, was the, in the Times colonist newspaper, politician, and uh, this paper that we're looking at is the Montreal newspaper called Canadian Illustrated News. Maybe if, if you can look in the background there, it says, oh, it says, uh, washing and laundry, Qilong, Qilong, it says there. Amor de Cosmos, he may have been a lover of the world, but he was not a lover of Chinese people, all right? Speaking of putting the Chinese through the ringer, uh, there's um, the middle image there. On the far left there, me washi e all cleany. Me use uh, soapy. If you're in the UK, you may, uh, may not be calling that tool there for wringing out laundries, a ringer, you may know it as a mangle. Anybody know it as a mangle? Yeah, mangles. Mangle, ringer, whatever, it's the same thing. It's either way the, the, the Chinese person is being put through the ringer there. And this is only a sampling of things that I found on the internet. There's no shortage of, of uh, derogatory images of the Chinese laundryman being denigrated. Anybody from CBC here or formerly from CBC you can look away here. <laughs> uh, uh, years ago uh, on CBC there's a program called Ideas and um, they, they did a story on Chinese laundries. In this Ideas program, producer Yvonne Gall explores the legacy of these Chinese pioneers through the stories of the children who grew up in their parents' laundries. This is her documentary. Chinese Laundry Kids. The Chinese laundry man was once ubiquitous in almost every town and city across the land. So much so that the occupation of laundry man became synonymous with the Chinese. But this very identifiable minority endured many hardships, the least of which were racial slurs and ridicule. Now Mr. Wu was a laundry man in a shop with an old green door. He dying all day, your linen away, he really makes me sore. He's lost his heart to a Chinese girl and his laundry's all gone wrong. All day he'll flirt, got your shirt, that's why I'm singing this song. What shall I do? I'm feeling kind of limehouse, Chinese laundry blue. Men, mostly from the southern coastal parts of China, came first to the gold fields in California and British Columbia. Later, they were hired on to build the railways in both Canada and the United States. But once the gold rush ended and the railroads had been built, they were no longer wanted. These Chinese immigrants were socially isolated and struggling against a growing tide of racism. They gravitated to jobs shunned by the white community, jobs like washing clothes. With a minimum outlay of capital requiring little English, they opened up hand laundries. It was a hard life, but they persevered because returning to communist China and a life of poverty was not an option and they endured so their children would have a better life. In this Ideas program, producer Yvonne Gall explores the legacy of these Chinese pioneers through the stories of the children who grew up in their parents' laundries. This is her documentary, Chinese Laundry Kids. The first laundry probably opened in San Francisco around 1850. That's when the lure of Gold Mountain attracted thousands of Chinese migrants. But once here, white miners in California and British Columbia didn't want foreigners moving in on their claims and settling in their towns. But not all portrayals of Chinese laundrymen were demeaning. There was a recognition that they worked hard and had a knack for getting clothes very clean. It was often referred to as the ancient Chinese secret, a stereotype exploited in this television ad from the 1970s. How do you get shirts so clean, Mr. Lee? Ancient Chinese secret. My husband, some hotshot. Mr. Lee's wife then reveals the real secret is Calgon. 
busting the myth that the Chinese are an ancient and mysterious culture, and also exploiting the stereotype that the Chinese are best known for their laundry expertise. Ancient Chinese secret, huh? Calgon helps detergents get laundry up to 30% cleaner. All right. It's hard to believe, but uh, at one time, laundries were sent to the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, for washing because there were no local laundries. And perhaps that's when the Chinese, uh, after they were unemployed after the completion of the railway, found a, a business opportunity. So why the growth of laundries and the, and the need for clean clothes? Well, there was an awareness of diseases caused by germs and bacteria, and that therefore you need uh, to have clean clothes and to uh, keep yourself uh, lickly split clean. And cleanliness was also uh, tied in with a higher social standing. I mean, who wants to date someone that's uh, smelly with the dirty clothes, right? And there's also, in terms of uh, industrialization, urbanization, there was the densification of cities resulting in less space in apartment dwelling to, uh, to wash laundry. Did the Chinese operate laundries in China? No. Washing was considered, uh, in North America, washing was considered women's work. So to the uh, North Americans, macho males, uh, no competition. Or what other reasons were there? There was low capital startup costs, unskilled labor. You didn't have to go to school to learn how to wash clothes manually. It was labor intensive. And if, well, was, of course, it was also uh, a little bit demeaning to be washing other people's filthy clothes. All you had to do was uh, be prepared to uh, put up with long hours, six to seven days a week, uh, something that I'm not unfamiliar with, and uh, be your own boss. You can hire yourself. No one's going to uh, fire you. There was all types of legislation, bylaws, ordin ordinances in, in America uh, to stymie Chinese laundries uh, in both countries. I mean, this is just both in Canada and USA. I, I would imagine it's probably very similar to uh, New Zealand, Australia, and all the other uh, countries in the British Commonwealth. There was the legislation to stymie Chinese laundries, sanitation health legislations to stymie Chinese laundries, oh, bylaws to uh, prevent uh, hiring white women, bylaws to by organized labor protesting against Chinese laundries, limitations of hours of operations, municipal zoning bylaws, Competition to white laundries, American uh, by ordinances in 1870s, uh, San Francisco, forbidding uh, Chinese people to carry uh, laundry on horizontal bamboo poles. And the list just goes on and on and on. And any one of these topics would be a academic dissertation. All right? So I'm just simply uh, gleaming over uh, the, uh, all these large topics. As an example here, this is something I found on the internet. This is from like 13 years ago. It says here, uh, permits were required to operate a laundry in a wooden building, but not in a brick one. Chinese-owned laundries were almost always in wooden buildings. So when they came in for a permit, the judge would deny it for Chinese-owned businesses and allow it for white-owned laundries. Here's something that you may not know. This is just something I kind of grew up with. Uh, so in Chinese, uh, the top word is, uh, in Chinese it says, sai yi guan. So literally, wash, clothes, place. And the second word is yi xiang guan. Yi xiang guan. Literally, clothing shop. So if you were a Chinese laundryman in North America, and you want, and your family, your wife and children are wondering, what are you, what's dad doing over in, uh, in Gold Mountain? Do you want your family to think that you are washing the dirty clothes of the white man? No. Uh, you're going to write down something really generic and let them think that you're doing something better. So if writing letters, they would use the second word, yi xiong guan. So, oh, oh, dad is uh, selling clothes, operating, uh, selling uh, retail suits in North America. Oh, goody. Straight off the internet, according to sources in Wikipedia, around roughly uh, 1900, one in four, one in four ethnic Chinese men in the United States worked in a laundry, working a typically 10 to 16 hour days. So this is America, one in four 
honestly, I think the, the, the numbers may not be that far off for the, uh, the Canadian experience. And here's something from, uh, I, I ripped from the web page of uh, pastpresence.ca. The uh, genealogist is Linda Yip. And uh, I know you can't see it on here, but um, if you look here on, on, here on these occupations there, like laborer, laundry, laundry, laborer, labor, 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 laundry, laundry, labor, laundry, that gives you an idea of how, how commonplace the occupation the Chinese laundry was. How common is it, the Chinese laundry? Well, there's two books in America. Uh, the Chinese Laundryman, A Study of Social Isolation by Professor Paul C. P. Su, and uh, also Chinese Laundries, Ticket to Survival on Gold Mountain, and that book is uh, on the table there. Uh, I had the good luck to, uh, good fortune to submit my little story in, in John's book, the late John Jung. Uh, closer to home in Canada, there are two books that comes to mind, Endearing Hardship, The Chinese Laundry in Canada by Professor Bang Seng Ho. And the other book that comes to mind is writer Judy Fong Bates, who also uh, grew up in the family laundry. She's, she's, uh, she's a lot older than I am, so she would have even more interesting stories. And her book is called China Dog and Other Tales from a Chinese Laundry. Heck, even in, uh, even in New Zealand, <laughs> there's, there were so many laundries in New Zealand. There's a book called Starch Work by Experts, all right, uh, by Joanna Bolibo. All right, so in, in Ottawa, what I knew as the Museum of Civilization, I guess it was, or Museum of Man. I think at one time it was the Museum of Man, then it became Museum of Civilization. Now it's the Museum of History, I believe. So they do have a, a laundry installation there in Ottawa. So there you go. Heck, even in Greenwood, there's an ex exhibition uh, in the museum there, the Hop Sing uh, Laundry. Hop Sing, I know, is a, is a character in the show Bonanza, but Hop Sing. Hop means uh, together, sing, uh, success. So together we succeed. So that's a common name. It's not actually a person's name. You'll find that a lot of businesses in, in, in the old-time Chinese, they had common common names. It, it doesn't mean it's their name, it's, it just means uh, get rich or be successful. That's why you hear some of these names, Hop Sing. And closer to home, uh, getting a little bit personal here, this is the laundry that I grew up in, in uh, for me it's 1960s, but my parents uh, purchased this uh, building in 1948. That's uh, in the southwest corner of uh, Union and Gore. Uh, today, it's, uh, it's Nora Hendricks Social Housing. And right behind today would be the, is the Prior Street ramp to the uh, Georgia Dunsmere Viaduct. So eventually, we would be pushed out, expropriated. And this uh, block today is uh, quite often you hear in the news as being uh, the 200 block union, uh, quite often known as Hogan's Alley, the former uh, community that had a lot of uh, black people. Black community. I wouldn't say uh, maybe it's before my time. I know the, the black community says it was black, but in my time, in the 1960s, it was a quite multicultural mix. Maybe in the 1930s, it was more black, but I couldn't say. And uh, 1960, uh, you can't see me in, in this photograph in 1960 because I'm in my mom's tummy. So, so behind there, Behind my dad, and then just below the clock, is, uh, is an ironing table. Maybe the, you've heard of images of the, the Chinese man uh, sleeping, sleeping on the ironing table. Yeah, it took place. <laughs> so I, don't, I didn't know it now, but I, I thought our family's like, well, what, what are all these people like, uh, like living with us? So I know today now that there were many bachelors back then, um, and I, they had, uh, I'll say it out loud, <laughs> they had mental health issues. So my parents took in uh, two uh, uh, bachelors. I don't know if my parents were really compassionate with great empathy to take them in or maybe a more like <coughs> capitalist exploitation. <laughs> we're not sure. But anyway, uh, Lo Wu would sleep on the ironing table back there and uh, he would, I still have images of him smoking a vote tobacco with his pipe. So I feel ter terribly now that as a... As a juvenile, I, sometimes I didn't treat them very nicely, and I wish I could have those days back and redo things over again, because um, back then I was a real jerk, I tell you. 
And this is my dad, age 49, um, Union Laundry. I'm so thankful that Bill Cunningham, the photographer for the Vancouver province, took this uh, photograph because it's like the best photograph I have of the laundry taken in 1969. And this is when the province newspaper was doing a story on expropriation and my father put up a fight and sent the, uh, both the reporter and the, the photographer. So the, the woman in the background is not my mother. It's an employee, uh, Li Jing Ho. I call it Baby Mu, like an old uh, elder lady. So I'll just let you know my father in this image here, um, a bit of background on my father. My father was born in 1920 on uh, Lulu Island, Richmond, a farming family. If you know where IKEA is today, that, is, uh, that was one of the locations where the family farm was situated. Uh, back then, uh, no electricity, no running water, outhouses, bath once a week in the galvanized tub. The typical uh, settler story. Right? So my dad, uh, so he grew up with, amongst his siblings, uh, speaking English. Right? And he was, I said earlier, he was trained in the National School in California because he was a bit of a, had a bit of a technical background. I guess maybe that's where I, I get that from. And this is me in uh, 1970. And uh, if you look at the two photographs, here I am uh, slaving away. <coughs> Weren't there child labor laws back then? <laughs> maybe it didn't apply to Chinatown. Uh, the photograph on the left, obviously the flash didn't go off, and you might be wondering, if they're both taken in 1970, why? It looks like they're taken in different years. Look like the photograph on the right year are a little bit older. And those of you who are uh, old enough will remember that there were days of uh, taking pictures, film. Sometimes you would uh, take a picture, you wouldn't take another picture for months, many months, because you have to pay for each photograph. So that's why there's a lapse of time. Uh, Pre-digital, I tell you. And I can tell by the bundle on the right there, I'm, I'm packaging the, uh, the bundle to the Astoria Hotel, 769 East Hastings. In case you're wondering about the bed sheet on the ceiling there, that's to catch the condensation. So in the winter time where it's very cold, and the inside where it's cooking hot, because we, got, we have all these industrial machinery, uh, you get condensation and dripping on you. That's what those bed sheets are. They're all over the The one on the, the left there, you, you see there's bed spreads and bed sheets and, and whatnot. And the old rotary telephone, the CIBC calendar in the background there. Kind of life, our Chinese laundry blues. Now Mr. Wu, he's got a laundry kind of tricky. He starts my shirts and collars, but he never touched me waistcoat. Mr. Wu, what shall I do? Between 1948 and the mid-1980s, my family ran the Union Laundry at 274 Union Street at Gore Avenue in Chinatown, Vancouver. We lived upstairs. The upstairs was always toasty warm from the heat generated downstairs by all the industrial machinery. In the summer, butter left out accidentally would become a pool of yellow liquid in no time. Hey, who left the butter out? The front of the laundry had the retail counter, while the back of the laundry was where all the work took place. In the washing area, there'd be water everywhere on the ground, as it splashed out of the machines. Wearing gumboots was a good idea in this area. Our retail customers were bachelors living in nearby rooming houses. Hello, can I help you? Hey, Sonny, uh, can you get my laundry? I'm running out of clean clothes to wear. Sure, mister. You got your ticket? Hmm, 646. Six. Uh, let me see. Mm, I can't find it. Uh, let me ask my mom. Mommy, uh, did you try to look to I wouldn't do I try to look I'm not that one. You have to hand and get fun. I don't My mom says it's not ready yet. Can you come back tomorrow at 2 o'clock? Not ready. I was hoping to change my clothes today. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, Union Laundry. Who? Tropicana Motor Inn? Missing 20 bed sheets? Oh, maybe we delivered one bundle to another customer by accident. Let me check with my dad and get back to you, okay? 
I'll call you back right away. I promise. Okay, bye. This is the back of the laundry. I said, this is the back of the laundry. Can you hear me? In kindergarten, standing on wooden boxes, us kids would start out folding fluffy towels and tarry bar tops from beer parlors. Anytime we had a load of dirty bar tops, our whole laundry smelled like a stinky beer parlor on Hastings Street. As us kids grew taller, we graduated to folding pillowcases, bedspreads, and bed sheets. When I was in grade four, I was coordinator of orders, a big job normally done by big people. After school, I took over at 4.30 p.m. as our employee went home. After wrapping hundreds and hundreds of packages with a twine a week, I had thick calluses on both my palms. Sundays may have been the Lord's Day of Rest, but for us it was Equipment Maintenance Day because the equipment was not in use. I would help my dad lubricate bearings with a grease gun, an icky job. Hey, Alvin, uh, climb up there and grease that top bearing, will ya? Okay, Dad. On another machine, the flat iron, I could squeeze into the natural gas inferno jet burner inside the rotating drum. This machine ironed bed sheets, pillowcases, tablecloths, and bedspreads. Can I get you to climb into the inner drum with a flashlight and a sharp poker? I want you to clean the plug jets. I could squeeze in like a mouse through a crevice. Okay, Alvin, now uh, move further to the right. Now ring the crap out of it, will ya? Okay, Dad. In the non-busy winter season, Dad would send me into the bottom of a wash machine. I'd first crawl into the open hatch of the Nassau capsule with a flashlight. With electrical power off, he would put the gear in neutral. Then he proceeded to slowly rotate me down until my hands could reach the mother load at the bottom. While rotating in the drum, I always said to myself, how could people forget to remove their money out of their pockets before giving their dirty clothes to us to wash? They must have money to burn or something. Hooray! Jackpot! With the free money, I knew what I was going to buy. Sarah was super duper friendly. Her business sign said, 7 up. You like it, it likes you. Learning to read, I loved reading the sign. Back and forth, forth and back. This is where I first learned about a non-Chinese food called French fries. Hey, kitty, kitty, kitty. Meow, meow. Hi, Sarah, how are you? Hello, Alvin, how are you? How is your mama? Ah, uh, good, she's... Busy working. What would you like today, Alvin? Uh, can I have some french fries, please, Sarah? All right. Hey, Sarah, who are the people in your pictures? Daddy's my family in the Caribbean. All I knew about the Caribbeans were pirates. The radio was tuned to OR600 News Talk Radio with Jack Webster. He'd say, We'll be back tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely. I'm Jack Webster. Other days, the radio was tuned to WX 1130 Country. There'd be Glenn Campbell, like a rhinestone cowboy. Doo -doo. Here you go, Alvin. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much. I love French food. I like my mom's home Chinese cooking, too, but French cuisine is the best. I frequently tagged along with my dad on deliveries in the Volkswagen van. My dad loved the Volkswagen. Easy to fix, he always said. Nothing to him. On the Chinatown run, the Yenlok restaurant was one of several Chinese restaurants which held wedding banquets on weekends. 
their tablecloths were gold color. The bags and bags of dirty tablecloths were heavy to lift, but even though I was a scrawny kid, I could carry heavy bags up and down the stairs on my shoulders, no problem. Pickups and deliveries into West End hotels was a real eye-opener. I realized some kids my age had fun, fun, fun summer vacations, visiting other cities or countries, touring, swimming, eating in fancy restaurants. However, for my family, summers was our busy season. Laundry, laundry, laundry everywhere. Dirty laundry, clean laundry, fluffy laundry, bundle laundry, as far as the eyes can see. All hands on deck. No time for fun in the sun. Hotels had indoor swimming pools. In some hotels, there was even a sauna room, a steam room, and whirlpool too. I wasn't quite sure what the difference was. However, I did recognize the chlorine bleach smell of the swimming pool since we use bleach for washing. Every time I saw kids my age swimming in hotel pools, I thought about signing up for the free swimming lessons sponsored by the Vancouver Sun newspaper. The application was in the funny section of the paper. I'll tell you a secret. After the bags of Chinese restaurant tablecloths got back to our laundry, they'd still need to be shaken out. You see, the waiters never bothered to pick out the dirty paper serviettes, the swivel sticks for alcoholic drinks, chicken heads, crab shells, lobster shells, all from fancy Chinese wedding banquets. Sometimes there would be chopsticks, silver forks, which would get added to our kitchen utensil collection. Hey, look! Wrapped up wedding cakes in pretty doily still. It should still be good to eat. As an adult, whenever I stay at a hotel or dine at a nice restaurant, I always think of my young self that used to wash and wrap all them tablecloths, bed sheets, and towels. Monsieur, a little more wine? Uh, oui, yes, please. Oh, no, I spilt the glass all over the tablecloth. You ought to see it wobble when he's ironing ladies' blouses, Mr. Wu. What shall I do? I'm feeling kind of limehouse, shiny, laundry blue. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to... Uh to uh, Runaway Moving Theatre and the uh, Vancouver Moving Theatre for assisting me uh, on theatrical uh, direction on that. Publications. Writer Maxine Hong Kingston, she grew up in a Chinese laundry and she became the uh, professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And she's uh, written a few books. Uh, the one that, that talks a lot about the, the, her experience in the Chinese laundry is uh, The Woman Warrior. Who else uh, grew up in the Chinese laundry besides me? Well, the famous actress, Hollywood actress, Anna Mae Wong. She grew up in the family laundry as well. She grew up in the uh, Sam Key laundry, the Sam Key laundry. And her years are between 1905 and 1961. And uh, listed there are some of the movies that she's uh, performed in. Her story is that, oh, when I was growing up in the laundry, I couldn't stand growing up in the laundry. I, I just needed to get out of here and I need to do something bigger and greater. And that pretty well sums up what motivated me to get out of Chinatown and the family laundry. For those of us that grew up in the laundry in, the, in, the, in Chinatown, we couldn't get out of there fast enough. I know to these days it might be very romantic and idealistic, but we couldn't get out of there fast enough. How do we know that uh, Chinese laundries are an institution? Uh, even even uh, even the whiskey bottle, the lines the Limestone Whiskey Company has made a a bottle of the Chinese laundryman, and that's it sitting on the table right there. There you go. And what does it say? It it says when the Chinese began pouring into California to search for gold, 
they found the prejudice of whites so bitter they couldn't mine for, themse mine for themselves. Their properties were taken, and in many instances, they were murdered or run out of the town. They then turned to operating laundries and restaurants. Thousands who had been working on the railway uh, construction found themselves stranded in the Rockies. They turned to laundry work, and the phrase, no tiki, no laundry, became a byword throughout the nation. I would like to uh, read from you from this publication, uh, Chinese Laundries, uh, Ticket to Survival on Gold Mountain by the late uh, John Jung. The laundry was an odd cacophony of sounds. The hiss of leaky steam pipes merged with the noise of an out-of-balance centrifugal extractor ready to fly off its base. The sound of water splashing back and forth, forth and back in the washers were interspersed with the whirling howling noise of a three-phase motor in high current startup mode. The concrete floor around the washers was constantly wet due to water cycling out of the washers and there would be footprints everywhere on, or there would be uh, wheel tracks, wheel tracks, if I was uh, roller skating while working. Sounds really safe. <laughs> in the air was a hint of detergent or bleach, depending on the nature of the load. My father made full use of my agility, but I've since grown up to appreciate things mechanical and electrical. I spent, as a kid, countless hours as a boy staring at welding flashes as my father was handy with welding and pipe fitting. The lighting effects in the laundry were like a combination of of a fireworks display and strobe lights in a nightclub, complete with a smoky haze. So I'd just like to end by acknowledging my parents, uh, my mom, May, and my dad, uh, Harry. So I'll just let you know that the, the photograph on the left there is my parents uh, uh, married in 1937. My mom is age 15, my dad's age 17. Uh, yes, they, people got married a lot younger back then. And the photograph on the right is uh, 1960s. I, I'm a, I am in my mom's tummy in 1960. My mom is 38 and my dad is 40. So uh, the reason why I've got these two photographs separated is because um, my parents uh, lived apart for 11 years. So as you may well know, if you've been following the news, uh, 2023 is the 100th anniversary, not anniversary, is 100 years commemorating the uh, 1923 Exclusion Act. So my parents were separated because of the Exclusion Act. So my father arrived in, uh, in China in 1937 to, to get a, obtain a Chinese culture and education. And unfortunately, he had bad timing. He arrived in 1937. And uh, what happened in 1937? Well, we now know that the Japanese Imperial Army, uh, they, they moved into China. And, and uh, while my father was there, he got uh, matched up with my, my mother. If, there was, if there's any silver lining in this whole Chinese Exclusion Act, is two things. Because the Chinese were basically uh, documented so well, basically like criminals, uh, in the Library Archives Canada that has now been opened. So Library Archives Canada has uh, opened up the vault after 100 years. The, uh, you can now view the... CI-44s, so uh, Chinese families, if you want to see what your forebears look like, description, you want to know what their height, you want to know if they had facial scars, it, it's all carefully documented with a photograph, just like a criminal. But uh, however, Scottish uh, settlers coming in through, say, Pier 21 in Halifax, come on in, come on in, there's no documentations. So that's one, one side benefit of the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. The other, the other silver lining is that because of separation, uh, I grew up speaking English to my father because he was, he was born and raised here in, uh, in Canada, right? He was, he, he was part of the, um, the uh, Allied Forces home front. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, I communicated with her in Cantonese, but not just Cantonese, but the, village, the old village dialect, uh, which is kind of like a synonymous with the old gold panned gold panners and uh, railroad workers, not this highfalutin uh, Cantonese and even more highfalutin Mandarin today. 
So I'm a bit of an oddity because my Cantonese is like, it's like locked in a frozen time that is still formerly used by the old timers. So it's the authentic uh, dialect. So I have the, the, uh, the racist Chinese Exclusion Act to thank. So uh, that concludes my presentation on Chinese laundries and uh, I thank you so much. I just wanted to uh, let you know that there are these uh, show and tell, there are these little photographs that you can sh uh, circulate. All, they're all a little bit different. Uh, you'll see that there's a wooden laundry peg attached to a laundry ring. And the story behind the laundry ring is that as a kid, I, I, I did uh, adult work basically, packaging uh, the, uh, the, the, all the bundles of laundry, and they would be wrapped in, in twine. And to cut the twine, rather than using scissors, uh, we would have a ring with a cutting knife on it. And for safety reasons, I've taped it off. But uh, you'll see that there's brown uh, twine wrapped around the rings, and that's because these rings were meant for adults, not for little children. So as a kid, I would have to take up the slack by uh, wrapping up with the twine. All right, I thank you so much for joining me today. Take care. All right, uh, are there any questions at all? Oh my goodness, uh, I'll have, the first hand up was uh, John, yes. Thank you very much for that, El. Uh, my question is, uh, it seems so from what we saw, that much of the, the laundry work was commercial, was for hotels and restaurants and things like that, rather than personal stuff. Was that, was that it was a mix. It was a mix. So we had uh, re retail uh, as well, as you noticed in the, uh, in the shadow there. We had uh, bachelors come in, well, not just bachelors, but whoever didn't have a laundry, uh, we will wash their laundry. So that was retail. And we also had uh, commercial uh, hotels and restaurants and cafes and uh, diners. So it's a mixed bag. And it's a, uh, yeah. So it's mixed. It wasn't just, uh, just one or the other. It was, it was a mix. Uh -huh. uh, next question was, I think it was uh, Vern? Did your parents encourage you and your siblings to continue the family business or were they, or did they encourage you to get an education and? make a different life for yourself. Yeah, so there was always a, a, a bit of pressure, like not just in Chinese laundry parents, but I think in, in a lot of Chinese uh, Canadian families to excel in post-secondary institutions, get an education, and do better than us. Just That's like for most parents. Um, and honestly, yeah, you'll, that's, that's an explanation why the, the next generation, they all got an education and couldn't get out of Chinatown Fast enough. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, question. Mm -hmm. um, I just was wondering uh, if you know about the kind of, like the Chinese laundry and Canadian lit is not quite so iconic as the Chinese restaurant. Fred Wah has written a book called Diamond Grill about his father's restaurant in uh, Nelson, the Diamond Grill and Disappearing Moon Cafe. By, uh, Sky Lee. Sky Lee, yeah, and uh, but it's really. I'm just trying to think. If there, I know there are some essays on the Chinese laundry, but it would be interesting to know if there's any um, fiction or autobiography based on it. But that's very interesting presentation. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. So one thing, um, Susan Allison, who's famous around here. Uh, was writing for the Samokamian Star in the 1900s and the 19-teens uh, about her husband's early travels in the Samokamian, and she states in one of her articles that when he first arrived at the forks of the Tuamine and the Samokamian rivers, there was Johnny McDougall, who was a Métis from Red River who had worked for the HBC. He was panning for gold up here. And so were some Chinese miners. So it's kind of interesting that some of the earliest people to surface in the Princeton area were uh, not necessarily white trailblazers, but some Chinese uh, gold panners and Johnny McDougall and others like that. 
I would say Chinese restaurants are more more talked about, better documented, and you'll see them in installations. I think part of the issue with the Chinese laundry is that there's a lot of shame uh, attached to this uh, racial profile. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a racial stereotype. So my response to that racial stereotype is like, hello, like racial stereotypes are based on something. It's because there were so many of them. There's such a plethora of the Chinese laundry. So there's been a real reluctance, even within my community, to talk about the, uh, the institution of, of laundries. It's, it's humiliating, it was de de uh, degrading, and it's the same reason why a lot of the Chinese uh, didn't, never talked about this thing of exclusion. It was humiliating, so we don't want to bring it up. And that's why we have an entire generation uh, of, uh, of, of the children whose parents were completely separated for many, 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 many years, but don't know about it because our parents didn't want to talk about it. Similarly with the, the Chinese laundry, we don't want to talk about it. Let's, uh, let's talk about something else, something, uh, all right. Uh, another question, uh, yes. Uh, Helen, what happened to the business after the building was expropriated? Did it keep going or was that it? So after the expropriation, uh, we, uh, my father was a holdout for many years. He wanted a better deal from the city of, of Vancouver. So eventually, uh, all my neighbors got expropriated, uh, much to my chagrin, because they were all my playmates. So eventually, eventually, uh, the city of Vancouver offered my father a significant amount of money. And what did my father do with this money? And as a kid, I had hoped and prayed that we would not continue with the business. Ay, 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 what did my parents do? They built a brand new laundry, double the size, across the street. It's like... <laughs> There goes my social life. <laughs> I had dreams of ice hockey school camps and Boy Scouts, and I spent the rest of my uh, life, uh, my childhood life, uh, working in the laundry. And shortly after that, uh, both my parents uh, passed away uh, it, while I was in my 20s from, from c cancer in quite succession. So eventually, um, uh, so that was, uh, so I think when we moved away from our original address of 274, it was, a, it was a, a series of uh, bad luck in our family. We'll just leave it at that.